Good morning. We're going to get started. Want to let you know if you don't already know that um, after service today, we'll probably have like a 10 minute break and then we'll come back and gather for our annual meeting. Uh, if you're not a member, you can still stay and it's pretty exciting stuff, I think. So it is a good time. Um, and then at 4 p.m., we have just prayer if you're able to come back to pray. A few other announcements in your bulletin, like the Sunday school classes, new adult Sunday school class in their description and some of the small groups and things happening through the week. So take a moment when you can. Let's pray. Gracious and almighty God, we ask you to settle us, allow us to be in your sanctuary and to separate just a little bit from what is waiting for us in the world outside these walls. Help us to be open to you, Lord. Pray for your Holy Spirit to move in this room and in us, to convict us, to allow us to come into your presence, to be able to confess, to praise you, and to take communion today, Lord, as a reminder of what you have done for us. God, we ask you to, in that separation from us and the world around us, allow us to hear you this morning, to be changed by this encounter in worship today, we pray. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Good morning. Again, welcome, especially our guests that have joined us this morning. Uh, a friend told me once, uh, they were talking to someone at the U.S. Mint, and who was an expert on <coughs> fraudulent counterfeit money, and, and they asked them, how, how do you look at all this fraudulent money? And, know if it's fake. And he replied, I don't look at the fraudulent money. I look at what's real. And I thought when I heard that in all the recent, uh, all the things that we hear, uh, whether it's recent or, or not so far past, uh, all the noise, all the people yelling at each other over different issues in our country and in the world and uh, all, of the, all of the supposed truths that are out there and what's, what's a fact and what's not. And I don't know about you, but it can get really frustrated, become very frustrating for me to hear it all. And then I'm reminded of this story and, and where do I turn to for the truth? Where do I get my reference point? And I find the most peace in my life when in all this noise, I turn to Christ. As 
the truth and the reference point for my life. And I encourage you to do the same and see if you find the same kind of peace. We begin our service with our greeting. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us access to his grace. The peace of the Lord be with you. Would you please rise for our call to worship? <coughs> People of God, thank the Lord. Praise his name. Tell the nations what he has done. Let them know how mighty he is. We will sing to the Lord, for he has done wonderful things. We will make known his praise around the world. Let all the people shout his praise with joy. For great is the Holy One of Israel who lives among you. And now we'll, from our hymns, hymn books, number 10, we'll uh, sing, O Worship the King. Thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let, Let Israel say, his love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his love endures forever. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die, but live, and will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open, Open for me the gates, the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks. For you answered me. You have become my salvation.
The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this. And it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Lord, Lord save, save us. Lord, Lord grant us success. success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God. He has made his light shine on us with bows in hand. Join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are, you are my God, God and, and I will praise you. You, you are, are my God, God and, and I will exalt you. you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever.
Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, our, our sins are many. Oh, but your mercy is so much more. Lord Jesus, we pray as you heal and strengthen us in coming to you and bringing our sins to you, that we can also have a heart for others, a merciful one for others who may not agree with us, may not treat us well, but that we can respond to them in mercy as well. Give us hearts like yours, Lord, and we thank you for the precious sacrifice you made for us when we showed you no mercy, yet you've given us all the mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. One moment, please. I gotta look it up. Okay, so this is a reading from uh, Paul, his letter to the Romans. Chapter 10, 10, verses 5 through 13. Moses writes about how the law could help a person do what God requires. He writes, the person who does not have these things, the person who does these things will live by them. But the way to do what God requires must begin by having faith in him. Scripture says, do not say in your heart, who will go up into heaven? That means to go up into heaven and bring Christ down. And do not say, who will go down into the grave? That means to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The message is near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. This means the message about faith that we are preaching. Say with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God, is, God raised him from the dead then you will be saved. With your heart, you believe and are made right with God. With your mouth, you say what you believe. And so you are saved. Scripture says the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. There is no difference between those who are Jews and those who are not. The same Lord is Lord of all. He richly blesses everyone who calls on him. Scripture says, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. We take communion in our church twice a month. And I, in just a moment, will say some words over the cup and the bread that are not magical words. They are words that remind us of the sacrifice that Christ was willing to take and do. We uh, heard the passage back in Micah when I was preaching in the book of Micah, that last part in chapter 7 when Micah, through God, tells the Israelites and us that our sins are hurled into the sea. And we do not have to walk around with the blood guilt of what it means to have sin around us. Uh, coming here today and taking communion is a wonderful thing. Hearing the words of institution, I'll say in a moment, are, are wonderful things. Quoting Micah, that my sins are hurled into the sea, are wonderful things. But that's just knowledge. And this is not about me convincing you of something or telling you knowledge. This is about a relationship with Jesus Christ that says, I know with certainty because of Jesus, 
in my life, you know with certainty because of Jesus in your life that you can, you can come to this table. And because it's a relationship with a person and not a bunch of words, if you have things standing between you and Jesus today, you can come to Christ as well. This is a, a table of remembrance, as well as confession, as well as being reminded of the mercy and the grace of Jesus. I'm going to invite the deacons to come forward. On the night when Christ was crucified, he gathered in that upper room with his disciples and he broke the bread, he passed the cup, and he tried to explain to them what would happen, something he'd been explaining to them the entire time that they had been his disciples, what this would mean for us, that the breaking of the bread was the breaking of his body for our freedom, and the passing of the cup was a new covenant instituted by Christ. So today we eat and we drink in remembrance of Christ. in remembrance of Christ.
So we drink not only in remembrance of Christ, but we drink together as his disciples until he comes again. Let's close in the Lord's Prayer together. <coughs> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. It is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. a reading from, reading from the book of Joel, chapter 2, verses 28 and 32. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. This is the word of the Lord.
we've been moving through Joel. Sometimes, depending on the books, we skip around in the book, but Joel, we're going through the whole thing. And um, as we've heard in Joel, God is calling the people back to him in repentance through worship. We don't know exactly when Joel was written as a book. We don't exactly know what the sins were. We can take an educated guess as to what the sins were. It kind of falls into the same genre with the Israelites. It is uh, turning away from God and making something else an idol. Not worshiping with their whole heart because sin is standing in the way. And so God calls them back and he calls them back very specifically through worship. And we see that um, God's desire through worship is for them to encounter him again and for that to change the relationship. God wants them back in relationship with him. God has called the Israelites way back in the desert to be his people. And so all of this worship, the encountering we do with God in this room, is to help facilitate that relationship with him. When we talk about relationship, it is important to stress that a relationship with God is free. It is our choice. There is no coercion on God's part. He's not saying, do this or else. Uh, what God does do is full disclosure of what it means to follow him and serve him as our God and as our Lord. Um, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy is full disclosure. It's not the tiny print on those drug commercials on TV that you have to like pause to read all the side effects because they can say, look, we gave you the fine print. God doesn't give us fine print. He puts it out in the open and he says, if you're going to follow me, this is what it looks like. And so the Israelites choose to follow him. Um, and that path, just like our path with the Lord, sometimes gets knocked off course. We've been talking about how God has called them back into worship and how worship is not an experience. We don't come in here to have an experience. We come in here to have an encounter. We encounter the Lord, and that encounter should change us over time. Showing up week after week with God, sitting in this space, uh, discipleship and prayer and all the other stuff we do to get to know God allows us to have an encounter with him. And that's pretty wild, that God wants us to encounter him and to know him and to have a relationship with him. And so that, over time, should change us. But then what? What do we do when we leave here? How should that relationship, that encounter, this worship time in here change what I do out there? I mean, we're going to leave here, and because we haven't had an experience, we've had an encounter, um, you've, you've met God in this room. Hopefully, all of us have, have sat in this space. Um, but then what happens when you go out there, and you meet an obnoxious driver in the parking lot of the grocery store who cuts you off? Or you're at the Super Bowl party and your family or friends are really kind of hostile to where you've been today. Or maybe they're okay with you being a Christian and they're just hostile to your version of it. Or maybe you go to work on Monday and you have to put your game face on because you don't dare talk about where you were today, right? Or you show up in class, or you show up with your friends. How does what we do in here change how we are and who we come into contact with out there. Does it? I mean, there's a couple of options that you can do. You could never encounter anybody out there, stay in a nice little bubble, right? I went to a Christian school growing up, and I always heard about the them. There was us, and there was them. And I remember graduating from Christian school going, I want to meet a them. I've never met a them. I want a them as a friend. Now that's one option, just don't ever meet the thems. <laughs> the other option is you can um, make sure that we're the majority. So that we, we conquer all the thems, right? 
and all the thems are now us. And so I never have to worry about redacting what I say at the water cooler because everybody is me. That's an option. Another option is to kind of compartmentalize what we do in here from what you do tomorrow. It's like that child who likes to keep their food separate on their plate. Like don't let the peas and the carrots and the chicken touch each other. So this is my work friends, this is my church friends, this is my family, just don't ever touch. Eventually it does. It... There was a, a book someone recommended to me several years ago called Blue Like Jazz. A friend of mine who was a pastor loved the book. <laughs> and I love jazz, so he's like, I'm, this is a good connection. Um, the book also became a movie, and the book by Donald Miller, um, I found to be a really difficult read. Not the content being difficult intellectually, but the content being difficult emotionally. Because I could kind of relate to the main character in a lot of ways. Uh, Don is the main character. He's a young man from Texas. He's grown up. This is where I don't relate to him, but he's... He's grown up in a, a household where the father is a deadbeat, absentee, pot-smoking philosopher slash professor who is obsessed with jazz and who thinks that Don has sold his brain out by going to church. Don's mother, who he lives with, is a codependent, reliant on men to solve all of her problems, constantly kind of getting into trouble um, with that route mom and Don is really the parent to both of those in the relationship. So Don grows up as a, in Texas, he's a Christian, he volunteers at his church with the youth group and he's all set to go to a Christian college when something on the day he is to leave collides very openly with his world and he um, changes, it changes everything about what he believes, what he thinks he's known, who Christians are, uh, where he's going to go, and so on a lark, he completely changes directions, ditches the Christian school, and goes to this college that his dad has already signed him up for to save his brain. That's what his dad says. So he goes to this college, and he realizes, like, the first class in that college that he's a cliche. He's a white male fundamentalist Christian showing up on a liberal Christian-hating college, <laughs> and he makes a decision real fast to fit in. So he pretends all of those, those other things about him don't matter. That's one way, right? Now I'm not necessarily telling you to go out and, and, and read Blue Like Jazz. It is, it is really well written by Donald Miller. Or even to see the movie. But I think what it shows in, in a little bit of a microcosm is what it means when we as Christians kind of get outside of our Christian bubble and become the minority. What happens when, when we interact with the world and we're, we're the ones that are being made fun of? And so then all of a sudden, all the stuff we do in here to change our heart and have that relationship with God, all of a sudden feels like we gotta figure out what to do with this out there. Go back to some of those options, right? So first one, um, just don't meet a them. Don's mother, that's what his plan is. She's like, go to Christian school, don't ever meet a them. Don't ever stray from, from what we do in here, and then you won't be challenged, and you won't have to worry about figuring out what to say or what not to say. I don't think that fits any of us in this room because you really can't leave your house. You're gonna meet at them at your doctor's office. You're gonna meet at them at your work. You're gonna meet at them in your own family. So that doesn't work, right? What about the option of creating all of them to be us? That's a good one. Just work really hard to make sure that we make it impossible not to be like us. I don't know if that works either because Christ did talk about this cross that we're supposed to carry. So maybe there are parts of this that's going to be hard. The other option is just not to have your food touch. But if that happens, then how important can this encounter be if you can actually go out there and no one out there knows that you've been in here? 
or if nobody out there knows how important meeting Jesus in this room is for our lives. Think about trying to keep your peas and your carrots and your chicken separated as you realize pretty quickly if you're doing the will of God, he's going to mix everything up. So what do you do? How do we have what we do in here influence out there? Well, believe it or not, that's actually in our passage today. Look back with me. I want to start with verse 27 first. This is the verse we ended with last week, but it's a really powerful verse that speaks to what happens when we start going out there. Look at verse 27. God says, then you will know that I am in Israel. Then you will know, yada, you're going to have relationship knowledge that I am in Israel. Um, When you translate this in Hebrew, it says, then you will know that I am in the midst of Israel. What does that mean? Midst, Ereb, means that, that God is literally going to be residing in the midst of his people. So God is saying, when you leave here, I'm going with you. Which is kind of revolutionary to think about it from an Old Testament perspective, because where you went to meet God was the temple and the sanctuary. The temple is called the Bat HaKmikdash, the house of the holies. It's God's house. We went into the tabernacle before the temple was built, the Mishkan. That was the, the place where you met God. You could always see that God was with the Israelites because of the smoke and the cloud, and you could tell that that's where God's presence resided. And so what God is saying in verse 27 to the Israelites is, after you encounter me, you come back to me and worship, all of that first part of chapter 2, I'm going with you. I'm going with you as a collective group. So when we leave here, we don't abandon God and get to put him in um, the genie bottle back up. God says, I'm moving with you. I'm going to be there in your present, in, in the midst of, of us. And there's a couple of things I think how this works out that looks at the rest of our passage, how God moves into the midst of us and influences what we do out there. And the first is he influences how we proclaim he is God. He influences how we testify that he is God. God's presence influences that. And then the last is God's presence tells us how to understand salvation. So proclamation, testimony, and salvation. Um, Look at verse 28 now. So God has gone with the Israelites. He's in the midst of them, and it doesn't end there. And afterwards, he says, verse 28, and afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all my people. And afterwards, After I've gone out with you and I'm in the midst of you, I'm going to pour my spirit out upon you. The understanding of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament is that it would come upon people always directed by God, always for short term, and always for leaders. So you see this on David. You see it on Samson. You see it on Moses. You see it on Saul. God takes it off, his Holy Spirit, when Saul goes down a dark path. So it's always for leaders, it's always for a short amount of time. And let me also stress, it is not mitigated by perfection. Samson is proof of that. Samson is a hot mess. But what God is doing with his spirit on Samson is using Samson to do ministry to further things. And that's how the Holy Spirit would work. It would come on people, God would put on and remove. God is now shifting it, and he's changing it up a bit, and he is not saying this is only for leaders. Look at what he says. Afterwards, when I go out with you, my spirit is going to be poured out on all of these groups. The sons, the daughters, old men will dream, young men, servants, both men and women. So God is saying there's a time coming when I will pour my Holy Spirit out on everybody, and everybody will proclaim who I am. Now, when this is quoted by Peter in Acts, it's after the Holy Spirit has come on that group at Pentecost. The individuals are meeting in the upper room. They're celebrating a harvest festival called Pentecost about 50 days after Passover. Penta in Hebrew is that 50. So the 50 days... And when they're there, Holy Spirit comes on them. Jesus says, I'm going to leave you with my comforter. And so when Peter is quoting this passage, 
to the group after that, he is proclaiming to a bunch of people who do not know Jesus, who Jesus is, and who God is. His proclamation is to tell the truth about who God is. And the manifestation of that proclamation comes from the Holy Spirit. God says, I will pour shafak in Hebrew. I'm going to pour out. This also is the word that's used to shed blood, which is really interesting when you think about what Jesus pours out on the cross. So God says, I'm going to pour out my spirit upon you, and that's going to be the catalyst for you able to proclaim. Stop there for just one second. Because <laughs> I think this is where we forget and we get derailed and all of a sudden all of those loops go in our head. Yeah. When we walk out this door and we, we confront individuals or we have to deal with situations that make us uncomfortable, we forget all of this is because of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit works through us. We're not mindless robots. We're not zapped into perfection. We are vessels that God is pouring his spirit out to so that when we proclaim, it is not my words. It's the power of the Holy Spirit working in us. You know those times where we say to ourselves, like, who am I to say anything? The who am I to say anything is if you know God, you're the who in the who am I. Think about this when Peter is saying this and quoting this passage in Acts. That's Peter. He has already denied Jesus. He's denied Jesus three times because he was scared, he was humiliated, and he had no idea what was going to happen because Jesus has just been killed, and he's sitting around not knowing what the day after is going to be. And so he denies him. He redacts the proclamation. He does not say he knows Jesus. The fact that Peter is using these words to quote after the Holy Spirit has come upon him is because what he is saying very loud and clear through him is these are not my words. In the who am I to speak about God, Peter would probably be one of those people that would say, guess what, probably not a good idea because you denied him. But that's not how it works. It's not Peter's words. It's God allowing the Holy Spirit to speak through Peter. Having a relationship with God does not mean that we get to have God in our pocket. It doesn't mean that our life is made better. It doesn't even mean we get a leg up on people. And having the Holy Spirit work through us and, and speak into other people's lives does not mean that those awkward conversations with family members are all of a sudden going to become easy. It does not mean that all of a sudden Monday morning around the water cooler is going to be just so easy to talk about what we did in here on Sunday. Right? It's not going to make everything easy, but the emphasis is taken off of us. <coughs> and put on God's spirit. And this spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, just like our relationship with God is this mystical, amazing aspect of what it means to follow God. The Holy Spirit is not something that we get or that we um, contain or that we can just kind of rub the genie's lamp and it pops out when we want. Poured out by God and tied to that relationship with the Lord. That's one of the things that Dawn in Blue Like Jazz doesn't get. So in the whole, what do I say, how do I not be the weird person in the room, Dawn's putting a lot of pressure on himself in Blue Like Jazz. He, he kind of forgets or maybe was never taught that what goes forward with us, before us, and, and what we are co-laborers with, who we are co-laborers with, is the Holy Spirit. And so Don's reaction to dealing with a college that hates Christians and makes fun of them is he says this great line in the book, for once, I want to be the person they're laughing with and not laughing at. So he completely denies that he's a Christian. He completely denies what, what his upbringing was. And there's this point where the realization that the Christians in his life were human and that all of the images that he had of Christianity are kind of challenged, he goes off the deep end and he loses it. But there's this great line in the, in the book about trying to understand all of that. He says, too much of our time is spent trying to chart God on a grid. And too little is spent allowing our hearts to feel all. By reducing Christian spirituality to a formula, we deprive our hearts of wonder. We don't have God in a way that makes us little gods. 
We don't have God in a way in our, in our lives that we can, again, put in our pocket and pull out when it's easy or when it's hard. If we have a relationship with God, then what God is asking of us when we leave this room is to proclaim who he is. That's it. And that proclamation and having the Holy Spirit speak through us is this powerful, mystical, I don't really understand all the time how to explain it, movement that is part of our relationship with God, which is part of our testimony. Look at the next couple of verses. Proclamation of who God is is also wrapped up in who we are. And that doesn't mean that my testimony is my interpretation of God. It doesn't mean your testimony is your interpretation of the gospel. Your testimony is where your testimony meets your story, meets the gospel. Evangelism, when we leave this room and we feel like we have to convert everybody or we have to avoid ever talking about faith, that puts a lot of pressure on our words. And if the Holy Spirit is moving through us, then my words are important but it's not the sum total. Nor do I have to deny who I am in being able to testify to, to other people. Our testimony, um, our life, and how it merges in with the gospel should be something that we talk about all the time. It should be something that's just natural. And I'm not saying we have to sound like Ned Flanders. And, and we don't have to put a Christian spin on everything. That's not what I'm saying. But you know what's amazing? When I talk about our, our animals that we're raising, or when I talk about soil, or when I talk about um, some health benefit, I never say in my head, I wonder if it's appropriate to talk about this with them. I don't ever think that because I'm so excited. And I just figure if I'm excited about soil, then you're gonna be excited about soil, right? If I'm excited about Jesus, then you're gonna be excited about Jesus. When I put my peas and my carrots and my chicken and I don't want them to touch, when I want this world not to touch that world, what I fail to understand is God wants everything touching. Everything that has happened in my life is part of that testimony. And so if I redact it, then I'm putting way more emphasis on me than the Holy Spirit. There's another great line in that book, Blue Like Jazz, where, where Don, he gets this. And he says, I love the fact that it wasn't my responsibility to change somebody, that it was God, that my part was just to communicate love and approval. It is not my job to change anybody. If we leave here and we think the only time we can open our mouth about the encounter we had in here is because we've got some goal or some objective or because it's the right situation, it's way more emphasis on us than the Holy Spirit. What God says in these next verses, the pouring out of his spirit, if you look at verses 30, or even 29, his servants, both men and women, I'll pour out my spirit in those days, verse 30, I'm going to show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood. What God is saying is, my creation in nature can't help but testify about me. God reveals who he is through the created order. He reveals who he is through us as well. But we, unlike the mountains, we have to think about whether we should say something, whether it's appropriate. The mountains just show who God is. The sun darkening, the clouds coming in, all of that is a foreshadow of what's going to happen when Jesus dies on the cross. The earth around, the creation around that cross can't help but exclaim what has happened. God's glory is revealed in earthquakes. God's majesty is revealed in the sun. Those things that we, we redact our stories, the world, the other part of creation doesn't hold back. Imagine that. God says, I'm going to pour out my spirit and you're going to testify, all of you. And look at the men, women, and the servants and the old men part. Don't miss the fact that who's testifying are people that nobody would really come to to listen to to begin with. God's not saying, get your life together, have a wonderful story, some great highlights, only perfection, get a really good position in leadership, and then tell people what I've done to you. No! Little kids, women, men, old. God says, I'm going to pour out my spirit, and then you pour that out to other people. 
The last part is the salvation piece. God says very simply, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So God is telling them in no uncertain terms how to be saved. How do we get saved? We call on God's name. That sounds really easy, right? If my testimony meant the difference between someone else's salvation, that'd be a lot of pressure on me. If someone else's salvation was contingent upon my proclamation of God, that would be a tremendous amount of pressure on me. You know what God's saying? Their salvation is dependent on them calling my name. So when we walk around and we feel this tremendous pressure and guilt and, and we weigh every word that we have to say or we, or we feel like we have to separate the out there from in here, the pressure that we put on ourselves to save other people, God is never putting on us. What God does say is point people to me, tell the truth about me, talk about what I've done in your life to people, worship me, praise me, follow me, study me, but he's not saying walk around with the burden of saving every single person. It's a lot of pressure. God says the way for salvation is to call on my name. By the way, embedded in that, that name, Adonai, Lord, means that you know who he is to call on that name to begin with. So it's our job not to save people, but it is our job to point people to that name. It is our job to say, let me tell you about a relationship that I have with God and to be able to uh, plant some seeds. It's the Holy Spirit's job to till the soil. Okay, so proclamation and testimony and salvation all sounds great. What do I do when I leave here? It's not easy not easy. I remember going to dinner parties in Cleveland and someone would ask what you do and I would say I'm a pastor and they would like turn around, you know? And I'm the guy screaming like, I'm the cool kid. You don't have to turn around for me. It's hard. It's not this easy line even when I do this as a job. We live in a world, and I don't mean to be crass, but we live in a world where, where the culture of the church and what God is calling us to be in relationship with him butts up against a lot of problems where we have a culture that deems sex as a recreational sport or where Christians sometimes are deemed mindless robots who are weak because we believe in God. And if what stood between me and convincing the rest of the world that God is God was me, we might have a lot of problems. But it's not me and it's not you. So when we go out into the world, we don't have to avoid people. Pray for the Holy Spirit to go before us. There are times when we're talking to people in the grocery store where we should be saying, God, Holy Spirit, just give me the words because I don't know really what to say. I was at a store the other day and the gentleman just very innocently said to me, what are you going to do for the weekend? Let me tell you what I'm doing for the weekend, <laughs> right? <laughs> there was like a split second where I thought, he doesn't really want to know. Guess what? I don't have to think that. All I have to do is say, Lord, give me the words. Put me in those situations. So that the God, the Savior that we meet in here, is out there among us, working in us and through us to bring people to him. Let's pray. Gracious and almighty God, we are going to sit in your space in silence. And we ask you, Lord, to speak to us today, we pray. Amen.
please rise for our final hymn, number 267, in your hymn book. Gracious Lord, take us out into your world. Let those who see us and interact with us see you in us, we pray, Lord. In your name, amen. amen.